I have been going on festival and doing some auxiliary work on the person of Melchizedek. Don't think you're going to sit here in the next hour and you're going to leave here and you're going to say, that's it. She, she laid it out and I'm leaving here and okay. There's so much about this person that actually becomes extremely important that if our understanding is not correct about this person, it essentially, it, it will alter our understanding of the purpose for why he is so explicitly uh, called upon in the seventh chapter of Hebrews. Now, auxiliary to the Bible. I've done some digging and I've brought some of these things to you. The writer Philo calls Melchizedek in the Greek automathe, that is self-taught, and autodidacton, instinctive. These are interesting observations from a very early writer who a lot of people didn't give too much credibility to because he had a tendency to um, use a lot of allegorical methods and in interpretation. When you jump down after I followed these on festival, Josephus, in both the mention of the antiquities of the Jews and war, both references, describes Melchizedek as the first to do priestly service before God and does not attempt to link him to Aaron or Zedekite or any of the other priesthoods, which is very illuminating. In fact, Josephus says David drove out all the Canaanites from Jebus, which is Jerusalem, which we have a record of when he claimed that Jebusite stronghold and it becomes Jerusalem. In the Qumran documents that we've been, I've been talking about, specifically the Genesis Apocryphon, we saw a great parallel between the Genesis account of our, of our English Bible that takes us back to the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek third, second, third century version of the Hebrew scriptures put into Greek called the Septuagint. We saw a great parallel, nothing too out of the ordinary. Now, I'm just putting this in the pot, what I'm going to say, and you'll have to tune, on, tune, tune in on festival to hear me talk about it, because I don't want to use up the time here. But as much as what is called the Genesis Apocryphon is very much in tune with the book of Genesis and the Chronicles we have, there's another scroll out of Qumran that is not. And much of the uh, belief not all of Judaism goes this way, but there's a split within Judaism that leans heavily on a scroll called the 11Q Melchizedek scroll out of the Qumran finds, where Melchizedek is seen as an end time. Uh, he is essentially in the year of, uh, in the day of atonement, the year of jubilees. He is the eschatological figure in the temple and some have equated him with the Michael the Archangel. He's seen fighting the forces of Belial. It's, you know, it's kind of out there, right? I'm just telling you. We'll talk about that on festival. It's a much better form to do that. Um, and you and I may better understand what happened within Judaism, why there was a kind of split, a branching off within the rabbis and their understanding based on an interpretation of Psalm 110, that if, if we chose to discard the New Testament, we only had the Old Testament, we may come to certain conclusions that would not be equal with the New Testament. And this is a lot of what happened in the fact that the body of the writing, the New Testament, of course, rejected by the Hebrew scholars, Jewish scholars. Therefore, certain conclusions were made about these other writings. So we'll discuss those on festival. They're very fascinating. Um, but probably it is once we get into the second century uh, BC, and I'm referencing just to show you in passing how we who have knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we have knowledge from the New Testament, and we understand that things that were placed in the Old Testament as prototypes, as shadows, are concretionized, are made solid by Christ 
taking up a tent of human flesh, Emmanuel, one with us, to redeem us, becoming our kinsman redeemer. But in the second century BC, out of some of the uh, writings that are outside of the Bible, you've got a very interesting picture, and I'll just read you that not, not all of the things that you find outside in the extra uh, biblical or in the apocryphal writing are nutty. They're not all crazy. I mean, some of them are, whoo, they're really out there. I have to confess. But this one, when I read this to you, you'll say, well, of course, we know who this is. We know who this one is talking about. This I read you simply to show that within the communities, they understood something about a future time. This comes out of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs from Charles Worth's uh, Old Testament pseudoepigrapha of apocalyptic literature and testaments out of the Testament of Levi of all places. And this is what, tell me where your mind goes when you hear these things. When vengeance will have come upon them from the Lord, the priesthood will lapse. And then the Lord will raise up a new priest. Now, don't, don't go hopping off on Melchizedek now. I want you to keep focused on the Lord Jesus. To whom all the words of the Lord will be revealed. He shall effect the judgment of truth over the earth for many days. His star shall rise in heaven like a king, kindling the light of knowledge as, as day is illuminated by the sun. He shall be extolled by the whole inhabited world. Who could that be? Hmm. All right. But 2nd century B.C. Christ, well, depending on whose calendar you're looking at, Christ had not yet been born. It's always in a, that's another anomaly for us. Another day we'll talk about that. Too many subjects, too little time. All right. Um, so let me read on. This one will shine forth like the sun in the earth. He shall take away all darkness from under heaven, and there shall be peace in all the earth. The heaven shall greatly rejoice in his days, and the earth shall be glad. The clouds shall be filled with joy, and the knowledge of the Lord will be poured out on the earth like the water of the seas. And the angels of glory of the Lord's presence will be made glad by him. The heavens will be opened. And from the temple of glory, sanctif sanctification will come upon him with a fatherly voice as from Abraham to Isaac. And the glory of the Most High shall burst forth upon him. And it, it just goes on. But it's all talking about Christ. And we're, you, know, you read that and you say, well, of course. We have, we have a full record here of that, of course. But to those who were writing and reading in this day, Christ had not yet come. So it's very clear what can happen if someone would ignore the New Testament writing and simply take off on a misinterpretation of either Genesis or Psalms 110. We could end up with some huge problems. That's why I started my message last week by talking about heresy, because inevitably heresy presupposes that there's something to depart from. You can't have heresy, really, in truth, without having a departure from something that, at the beginning, began a certain way. And without that, you, somebody said, well, can, can a person who is an atheist, can, can that be considered a heresy? And the answer is no, not really, because they have completely turned away from God. They've just completely departed. Heresy is just like a little bit out of focus just a little bit. And isn't that what Satan has been really quite good at? If you go back in the mystery religions in the Bible, the beginning with Nimrod and Babylon, you find it's just slightly off. And we see the difference between these false gods and the true God, Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah, being revealed. So it, these are, this is a background. This is some background information to why we should keep looking at this person and to ultimately find out, as I've said, the purpose of the writer of Hebrews, including Melchizedek. Now, we're not done, but what's very interesting is that by the middle, um, call it about 150, 160 AD, a man by the name of Justin Martyr. Sorry, young folks, it's not Justin Bieber, it's Justin Martyr. Oh, that was, that was funny. All right. Uh, introduced Melchizedek for polemical purposes. 
um, to begin trying to show an understanding of how this person, Melchizedek, was a prototype, which I, this is what I've been referring to. So what we have, let's first begin in Hebrews. And we'll be in Hebrews 7 for just a little bit, and then we're going to go somewhere else. What we have, as I said, this is somewhat uh, of a, an introduction in many ways to the seventh chapter. We've had Melchizedek introduced to us several times and then pulled back. If you think about it, back there, um, just before the writer of Hebrews gave a warning to the people, he says, well, I've got many things to say, but you're hard of hearing. You've become dull of hearing, so we'll come back to that. Um, but he starts and introduces the person, then pulls away. It's as if he has a word of exhortation, and then he returns back to the person of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, chapter 7, priest of the Most High God. Now, if you weren't here last week, linguistically, I showed you through the lesson, linguistically, how Melchizedek could not be Christ. And if you, didn't, if you weren't here, you should definitely watch the network. It'll replay at some point. That's extremely important. When you make a statement about something, specifically concerning the Bible, you've got to be able to back it up. There's no independent interpretation or things of that nature. You must back up and support what you're saying for it to be good, sound doctrine. So, on the heels of that, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, neither having beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Oh boy, we have lots to do there. Lots. All right. Now, some of you, most of you know, my specialty is language and digging. I, I coined myself the uh, archaeologist of language and digging into the Bible. Uh, and I like that because you, you dig and you dig and you dig and, until there's clarity that must come from something. And here, there is great clarity. I'll come back to these verses we just touched on. Now, consider how great this man, and you see was is in italics, that's added by your King James translators, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he he whose descendant is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed or the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there we have more italics. He receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. So blame the translators a little bit <laughs> for the difficulty. Uh, and as I may say so, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If, there perfection, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there of another priest that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Let me stop there. So there's a lot to digest. First, let me say this. It seems like people sometimes will read this passage and they read it with funny eyes. They put on a special set of blurry glasses to read this section right here. So let's talk about the without father, without mother, without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like. And remember last week we taught about the like, that is with the Greek iota. 
which means not the same, but similar. Remember that? OK. So this has been the controversy of the ages. And I'm not really wanting to camp on this, because I actually have none of this is part of my message, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, it's true, though. Um, but what is, what, is, what is apparent is that the writer is not trying to identify the, the focus is on Melchizedek's priesthood. He's not interested in trying to figure out, is Salem Jerusalem? Is Salem Salim? Is Salem Shechem? He's not interested in trying to find out. Now, see, now you're going to start hearing why this is so important. He's not interested about all the stuff we're interested in. Because he was fighting a bigger battle that didn't have to do with the location. Location, location, location. Has nothing to do with that. But see how this will fall into place for you. Melchizedek just appears on the scene in the book of Genesis. And we'll go there shortly. Don't turn there just yet. We'll go there shortly. But he just appears, and he disappears just as quickly. Now, even my late husband, he preached that he believed Melchizedek was Shem. And I'm not going to even make that statement. I'm not even I'm not going to go there. I can tell you. So you can walk out of here going, you know who he's not. He is not Melchizedek, is not Christ. Melchizedek is not an angel. And unlike Heracles of the uh, second century or so who said that Melchizedek was the Holy Spirit, he is not the Holy Spirit. So now you're now you're really confronted with a couple of things you have to deal with. Now, when you dig in the Bible, you end up sometimes asking more questions, and those questions have to, you have to come back at a later time to answer them because you want to keep focused on what you're talking about. So stay with me because I'm going to say something, and I'm not going to answer the question that I'm going to introduce. I'm just going to leave it hanging there. <laughs> you ready? So. Follow the thinking. Uh-oh. Once you put it in writing, you seal your fate. <laughs> so we just read, let's call, let's call Abraham Abe. <laughs> we just read that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And it says that Levi was yet in the loins of Abraham. That makes perfect sense, because the, the writer's looking at it from a genealogical perspective. Levi has not yet been born, but if you follow the line through Isaac, through Jacob, Levi will be born, and out of Levi comes the whole family, and so on and so forth, and the birds and the bees. All right. So what's happening here is very interesting. Sometimes you have to apply a little, a little logic. If Indulge me for a minute. We're going to do something that's kind of fanciful. If Melchizedek is Shem, then that means that Abraham paid tithes to Shem. What's the big deal? What's so special about that? That's his relative. That's so many generations removed. And the only thing that is quite anomalous is the fact that he lived for so long. In fact, if you do the math, you have Shem and Noah living into Abram's time. So you might say, well, you have to follow this logic, otherwise you're going to miss the point here. So if, if this is true, one could make the case and go the other way and say, well, although Jesus did not come out of Levi but came out of another tribe, you could equally make the case to say that somewhere down the pipeline here, pardon the pun, out of Judah will come Jesus. And therefore, we could, you could use that same logic and say, well, because this goes this way and goes down, and out of Judah comes Jesus, that we have the same thing. And that's not the point that the writer was trying to make. And the point I'm trying to make is that this person here, it's a lot more logical if you just focus on the fact that some people will get very excited and say, well, of course, it makes sense. So here comes the million-dollar question. 
Oh boy, I, I told you he's going to ask you a question, then I was going to leave it out there to dangle, right? I warned you. Don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> now, the logical person would say, well, if you read your Bible, you sure well know that there was a flood. And Noah and Mrs. Noah <laughs> got into the ark with their sons and their wives, and two of every kind, clean and unclean, and into the ark they went. And here's the big question, which I won't answer today. If the flood was global, whoever this person is, or is, is a descendant of Noah if the flood was global. And if the flood was local, this is an independent thought. Somebody, we don't know who this person is, he appears and disappears. Now, I told you I wasn't going to answer the question. I told you I was going to introduce something which is very thought provoking because most people read and they think the whole, there's, believe me, if you went into my library, I've got sections. I've got the section on where the flood is absolutely, absolutely, unequivocally global, and over here are the people that propagate that it was only local. And I told you I wasn't going to answer the question. <laughs> but the idea is to, pro to provoke some thought. If you're going to go down that pathway, to, it's almost to jar you out of the, oh, of course, I'm going to read everything like this, and I go like this, and I go like this. So, if the flood was global, you're still reduced down to whoever this person is, is a relative and a descendant of Noah. And if the flood was not global but local, then you have another thing to ponder. Now, I introduce that simply as a method of saying, regardless of that, which I won't answer today, but we could maybe go back into Genesis and look at that at a later time. That's another one of those subjects that you keep going and you get lost in, which is not my subject today. But there is a point that I want to make, and that is when the writer says, without father, without mother, without descent, with, without pedigree or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, I want you to think and stay in the Bible, because that's what the writer was doing. And what he's saying is this, Melchizedek appeared on the scene. Now, let me see here, who can I find? Okay, John, I know you, but I, I, have, I know you exist, but I have no clue of who your parents are or were. I don't know their names, only the fact that maybe you could be, your last name, H, you could be from an H descendant, and that's all I know. But I don't know anything else. I don't know your heritage, I don't know what country, I don't know anything. Now, put that back on Melchizedek. The writer is saying, we have no information about his mother, not that he doesn't have one. We have no information regarding a lineage. That's not to say that he doesn't have one. But we have, the writer is trying to emphasize this, neither having beginning of days nor end of life. Why? Because he just enigmatically pops on the scene, he's there, and then just as quickly he disappears. Goodbye. So think of it this way. When the writer is saying not having beginning of days nor end of life, he's not, you have to be really careful. The Greek will clarify what abiding or abideth a priest continually means. And you might say, well, doesn't that mean like forever? Well, there's a difference between what ends, verse 3, made like, the, made like unto the Son of God, like, similar, abideth a priest continually, which is an adjective, versus when it says a priest forever, that is ionis, the Greek word for eternity, forever for the ages, not an adjective. So when you see that immediately, you, you know the writer is pointing out something that has to do with the person and the priesthood. He's completely focused on that. The minute you start getting lost over here, da, 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 you're, you're gone, you're toast. He has a focus, the priesthood. Now, why do I say this? 
The priesthood here, if you remember back in the Old Testament, if you were just a regular priest, and I don't mean to abase, but if you weren't the high priest, but you were serving in any other capacity, you had a limited priesthood. You started at either age 25 or 30, and by 50, you were done. You were retired from service. If you were the high priest, you served for your life. Oh, boy. And in the case of Aaron, it cost him his life. If you remember, back there in the episode in Numbers 20, when the people were murmuring as if they didn't do that. You know, they only did it one time, right? <laughs> the people were murmuring and complaining. And God said, speak to the rock. And Moses, in his anger, struck the rock. The water came out, but God basically let Moses and Aaron know his displeasure. And in the following chapters, very disturbing because it says, God says to Aaron to go up to the mountain. That's where you're going to die. <laughs> Take your clothes off and give them to your son, Eliezer. Let him put them on. And Aaron died there at 123 years old. So, I'm, I mean, unusual things can happen that basically terminate your priesthood. <laughs> An unacceptable sacrifice on the Day of Atonement where no bells are ringing on the bottom of your garments, that means, oh, somebody's got to go in there and get that guy. Something went wrong. But the point I'm making is that what is being depicted here is a concept. So if we stay focused on the priesthood and you don't go on these peripheral things, which are quite satisfying and curiosities abound, but if you stay focused on the priesthood, you begin to see what his focus is going to be. Now, the reason why I mentioned the person, Justin Martyr, writing 150, 160 AD, is because he's the first one to point this out, that the priesthood of Melchizedek is hugely important and as a prototypical picture of Christ, not equal, same as, but in this respect. Let me ask the question this way was when Melchizedek met Abraham after the battle, was Abraham circumcised or not? Not yet. Not yet. That comes later. <laughs> you know, when you're 99 or like, it's like, <laughs> God, you got a great sense of humor. That comes later. Justin Martyr was the one to point out that in terms of a priesthood, Melchizedek as well, we could then say Melchizedek represented the representation to the uncircumcised. Now, that is a jarring thought. When you begin to focus in on what the purpose of the writer is saying here, it becomes something outstanding because he is combating the people in this congregation who want to go back. They have accepted Jesus, but they would like to go back to the old system of sacrifices and the priesthood that existed because they felt as long as they could tangibly touch, see, and do, that was more important than living by faith and the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, when you begin to understand this concept is being laid out, and the writer will go to the whole chapter to emphasize something about the purpose of Melchizedek. And once he's done, chapter 8 begins, and we have not another mention of Melchizedek. Just as soon as he makes the point about him, he moves on. He's done. Now, when we talk about the priesthood, there are several things that are important to recognize. We know that God had certain things he wanted done, in a certain way, when God gave the law, and I would say in the confines of the Pentateuch, we encounter really at the beginning when God calls Moses and then Moses says, I can't talk. Use Aaron. All right. So Aaron's going to be the mouthpiece. And then Aaron and his sons become the high priest and the descending line of the priesthood. And we know about the two sons of Aaron who went in, Nadab and Abihu, who offered strange fire, the Bible says, and they got killed right there, they, right on the spot. 
God, there were certain things that God would not accept. That strange fire, whatever that was, that was unacceptable. So there are certain things we know about the priesthood, the age of service. This is why when the writer says, neither having beginning of days nor end of life, he's talking about his priesthood. You may say, well, well doesn't this sound like he's eternal? Well, we're going to find out the reason why one should not hypothesize too much on that is because the writer has gone to great trouble to tell us about the eternal person and the eternal priesthood of Christ. Now, do you really think if he's trying to make an argument like a lawyer in a courtroom to try and tell you about the supremacy and the, the uh, effectiveness of Christ, do you think he's going to go back now and put something on par with it? Not. Are you following me? Yes. Good. Because it's a very simple thing, but it's really easy to get in there and say, ah, okay, now I'm ready to go. When you follow this picture of the priesthood through the Bible, through the Old Testament, and you've got, of course, when Eliezer dies, I believe it's at the end of Joshua, and a strange passage about Eliezer's son Phineas, who goes and kills a man and a woman to stay the plague, but you see how the priesthood, it will be uh, reconstructed, it will be put back together when the people come back out of bondage, out of being carried away into captivity. And then interestingly enough, at the destruction of the temple, everything stops. Now, if you are like me, and I love prophecy, I love prophecy that's been fulfilled, and I love the prophecy that's yet to happen, because the prophecy that's been fulfilled tells me how God had a hand in history, how God was orchestrating and making things come to pass, although at the time, whoever was writing didn't know this. I don't think they knew about it, but then you look back and you say, this is, this is God's faithfulness. So what's interesting is God established a new and living way in the person of Jesus Christ. And the writer will go on to tell us how the blood of bulls and goats would never be enough, how the law was not capable of perfecting anything. Now, a lot of people like to talk about the law and the law of God and the law of God, but Paul says at best all that the law could do, in both in, specifically in Galatians he talks about this, the law could only show you death. It could only show you the impossibility it could only show you what God knew was not capable, were not a, a possibility on the part of man that would take the coming of Christ. And if you read on in Galatians, it talks about the law falling on him. It is as though if Paul understood the one side of this, whoever's writing this understood the other side, which is the law made nothing perfect. Nothing could be completed or perfected by it. So this priesthood then is broken down by the writer. Now let's take a look at something insightful. In chapter 7, we've got a few things before I leave here, because I'm going to take you somewhere else. I told you none of this is my message. <laughs> oh, boy. There's a breakdown, and that is from approximately verses 1 through 10 in the seventh chapter. The focus is on Melchizedek, and there's even a small chiasmus in there, which I may talk about. Then verses 11 through 19, the focus will turn on the Levitical priesthood, with the emphasis there, and ultimately culminating in verses 26 through 28, the focus is completely on Christ and the efficacy of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Now, when you hear those words, our great high priest, the writer's already mentioned it many times, many, many, many times over. In fact, that's the unusual thing about this book is this is the only place in the New Testament where Christ is referred to as a high priest. But if you think about it, he fulfilled all the types and shadows, the day of atonement, representing what the, the work that the priest did in that holy of holies is typified and brought to its fullness in Christ. So of course he's our high priest. Of course all of this makes sense. So what's the focus? The focus right now for us today is going to be something about Melchizedek's appearance. All this was background and not my message. I know you're going, wow. 
Uh, but here is the focus I want us to see, which will help me a lot, because I have, over the years, I've tried to point something out, but this makes it abundantly clear. So if you, in your own time, go through the seventh chapter, probably till about verse nine or so, you'll find the repeated word tenth and ties and ties and tenths, as if the writer, as a subheading, is making a point about something. Now, if you want to know what that point is, turn with me to Genesis 14. Now let's take a look at this. We know that Abram is returning from the battle, the slaughter of the kings, Genesis 14. And those of you who read the apocryphal literature, be, be really careful. So, somebody was misquoting the book of Jasher and talking about uh, Melchizedek, and actually Melchizedek is not mentioned in Jasher. It is, a, in place of Melchizedek, it is a Dietzedek instead of Melchizedek mentioned in this passage. Some people like to talk about stuff. You need to make sure you check your sources before you quote them. Now, <laughs> that's just a sidebar. Um, so we have, we have Abram returning from this battle. And it's quite mysterious, by the way, because if you have Melchizedek just appearing, king of Salem, he just appears. Remember what the writer just said. Essentially, we have no information. Think of it this way. We have no information about his parents. We have no information of if there was someone before him, like a priestly line before him. We, we have no information. That is what the writer is saying. And when he says, we don't know about beginning of, beginning of days, end of life, because as he appears, he disappears. He is this person that will reappear in Psalm 110 for a completely different purpose. And then you can begin to understand why I'm trying to show you some of this information that came out of Qumran to show you if you didn't have the New Testament, you could start making interpretations galore about this person and misinterpreting what God intended to be as the most crystal clear picture and prototype of Christ. Now, believe it or not, as this person appears in verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be, italicized, blessed be Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And so we have Melchizedek is blessing Abram first. And then Melchizedek says, Blessed be the Most High God. He's blessing God. Let me take another color now which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And I want you to circle the word delivered. If you were reading this in the Hebrew, you would see this word looks like this. It's, and I can't even read my own writing, but I think it is, I think it is megin. Sometimes the vowels disappear. And as delivered, delivered. And then read with me, in the beginning of chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. You see that word shield? Yeah. Yeah, this is good. It has an eraser on it. So this is the same, essentially, the same word We'll do it this way for those who don't read Hebrew. We have Migen and Magen. You know, when they talk about the Star of David, Mugendovid, the Star of David, the Shield of David, it's the same word we're discussing right here. There's something very important that happened that if you recognize this is another one of these things that helps you to understand the person of Melchizedek 
and why Abram or Abram will pay tithes to him. I want you to read this very carefully. So Melchizedek says, Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, God did this. Now, remember, if you read a little bit early on, it says that he took, Abram took 318 men out of his household, able fighting men out of his household, and they went out to battle. Melchizedek says, God did this. God was your shield. God was your deliverer. God did this. Now, because we're so familiar with the text, he said, well, what's the big deal? Well, the question is, how did Melchizedek know? He wasn't there. Where'd the water come from? Never mind. <laughs> Are you seeing something very subtle? Melchizedek is giving the glory to God. He's blessing God for the victory that God won for Abram. He didn't say, you see the blessing here? He doesn't say, blessed be Abraham who went out and knocked the lacquer out of his enemies. He didn't say that. And he didn't say even, blessed be God, most high God, because Abraham went out because he ate his Wheaties, he and his men, and they really did a job and they did a number. It's glory to God. This is deliver thine enemies. God, which hath delivered, delivered thine enemies. And then you encounter in the very next chapter, God saying, I am your shield. I am your deliverer. I am your strength. Now, why is this so important? Because we, it's hard to understand. Why did Abram turned around and paid tithes to Melchizedek. Was it simply because he was a priest of the Most High God? But if you read between the lines, something very subtle happens here. How did Melchizedek know? You might say, well, of course. He must have told him, but it doesn't say that there. All it says is that he blessed him. He brought out bread and wine, and he blessed Abram, possessor, he says, possessor, of the most of heaven, heaven and earth, and then blessed be the most high God which hath delivered thine enemies. God did this thing, and then he gave him tithes of all. Now there's something in there that's that clicked in my brain, and that is recognition. You know, people say, Well, why should I tithe? Why should I give tithes? Tithes, they're part of the law. Well, do you read that the law was given here? Not yet. And yet, this is a response from Abram, and I want you to follow my line of thinking here because it's quite important. This man who was yet in Ur of Chaldees, God spoke to him when he was in Ur. God didn't speak to him and say, leave and then I'll tell you what's going to go on. He spoke to him when he was in that darkened land, in that land, spoke to him and said, get you out of your country and your kindred. Go on and I'll tell you and I'll show you a land and I'm going to give you promises. Too often we, we come up with ideas of how we will get to God if we'll just change our way, if we'll change our look. If we, we want to get out of her before God. We think that's the method that God will use. But God speaks to us right where we are, just like he did to Abraham. He finds you right where you are called him out of that land in that place and said, now go. And if you keep reading on, you find that as he journeyed on, we know he didn't completely obey. And they stopped in Haran, and his dad dies there, and then they move on. He brings Lot, and Lot the troublemaker, Lot the hanger on. But you encounter during this journey, Abram stops, he builds an altar, and it's assumed that in building an altar, he offered an offering there unto God. And then he journeys on, and then there's a, some other issues. There's a famine. They travel down to Egypt. Oops, wrong way. They turn back around. They go back to the place of the altar. And I'm assuming that when they got back to the place of the altar, they probably offered another offering. So it's not, I want you to catch the picture of something. It's not as though what's happening here is the first time not, the, not just the mention of a priest or a high priest. I even have to go back beyond Abram to make this point. When Noah got out of the ark, 
There was no mediator between him and God. He offered, it says he built an altar and he offered offerings upon it, both clean and unclean of the animals that came out of the ark. We have now Abram, and he is offering before there's even a mention of Melchizedek. And this is the first time we have someone called a priest of the Most High God who not only is seen as a first mediator as well, but the first one in recognition of saying, the Lord did this thing. The Lord won this victory for you. Here is the first proclaimer, if you will, in, in a strange way. It sounds very strange to say this, but here's someone heralding the work of God and saying, to God be the glory. And it's the first time that we have a person turning around and offering to another person. All the other offerings have been offered directly to God. It is the first of its kind. And what happens here is quite brilliant because you can, being so familiar with this, you can zoom by this. It's called recognition of God's person. Now, I asked the question on the way here to one of my staff people. I said, why do you tithe? Well, it's a form of worship. And it's a way of recognizing. I said, stop, because that's the key word. If you can't sum up the reason for doing something succinctly, it's probably because you don't understand it. If you can't sum up the reason why you stand and say, I tithe, and not because the law, it was refined in the law. But if you understand, it is right here is a snapshot of understanding, recognition, Later in the law, it will be demanded by the people to be given to the priests. But right here we have recognition of God's person. Recognition. Now, he pays him tithe. And many people have argued and said, well, the language, if you read the if you, people who do not speak Hebrew, who do not read Hebrew, saying what the Hebrew says. <laughs> How many of you are studying Hebrew with me? That's enough of you to know that I know what the Hebrew says, and it's very clear that it's not Melchizedek that paid tithes to Abram, but Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Recognition of God's person. If that's not enough, the anomaly of all this, and it is, it's anomalous, because later on in Genesis we'll have Jacob by himself with that pillar, and he'll vow a vow to God, and he'll vow, a t he'll vow to give a tenth to God, and there's nobody around. There's no, there's no person. And if you really want to get the, the picture that this concept was understood, even Joseph, when he was in Egypt, when he became ruler, essentially, over all of Egypt, having interpreted Pharaoh's dream, telling Pharaoh that there would be... Uh, famine to come. There would be years of plenty and years of famine. Joseph imposes a tax, 20%, on the prosperity, and then subsequently when the famine hits. I'm telling you, this is not just like, oh, well, these were good business people. There was, there was a concept right there. If you read carefully, he made sure that that 20% was paid to Pharaoh. Now, you say, well, that's not a tithe. Well, neither is a tithe the tithe. The beginning of understanding why somebody should say, why should I tithe, is found right here in Genesis. Genesis is a book of beginnings. Genesis is, is the book to the key of understanding, the beginning of sin, the beginning of prophetic word given by God, the beginning of hope, the beginning of many things. And right here we have the beginning of understanding of why a person should understand this passage as crucial and key to understanding why they should... Well, you should have told us you were doing a giving message. Of course not. Although I did say that in my opening comments earlier, but you probably weren't listening. Now let me just put this like this, and we'll... This is obviously to be continued, because I said this is not a subject you can just walk out of here and say, oh, okay, I got all the answers, but the one thing I want you to see is how unique this person is on the pages of this book that he appears. And as I said, the writer of Hebrews is not interested about the location. He's really not interested about anything else except principles that are being shadowed, the substance of which he will then go on to describe. This is the way God has... His whole book is like this. When Moses was about to 
build a house for God. God gave the pattern. The book of Hebrews records it, but it's right there in Exodus. See to it that you build it exactly to the pattern. Exactly. Why? Because it was a shadow, and everything in that tabernacle represented something of God, minus perhaps the table of showbread, mind you, but even that has its own type in Scripture. God was very precise. He wasn't playing tiddlywinks and horseshoes and close is good enough. Make it exactly like this. Why? Because it represents something. And the, the shadow is this, but the substance is much greater. But see to it, you make it exactly like this. Here we have another prototype of these. God was using this person in the person of Melchizedek. That's why I highlighted this last week. The iota, like, similar, not same to show something. So we have here priesthood or high priesthood serving God, the priesthood of, excuse me, of the uncircumcised. That's representing a priesthood that will later be bust open by Paul saying the wall of partition was torn down. There is no more a separation, a wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. That wall of partition torn down by Jesus Christ. And here we have Another one of these pictures, so not only just in terms of a type and a prototype, but also when people say, well, why should I tithe? Take a good look at what happens, recognition, although we don't have the, the exact details. We have a recognition. Did he give him tithes? Because he said, you know, Melchizedek, you're pretty deserving. You know, you seem like a nice man. You know, you look very trustworthy. I think I can trust you with my ties, but I want to make sure that I get credit for it somewhere, and I want to know where it's going. <laughs> you ever notice that that's, it's, it, these are all these strange things, that the behavior, and I, that's why I called it baggage, that people bring into the church, they're so concerned about these peripheral matters. The main thing is that you are right with God. I can't make you right. Only God can do that by His Spirit, by you staying in the Word, by you faithing, and the, the operation of faith, my late husband used to say this, and I, I'm now wondering how many people really believe this. He used to say, if you are exposed to God's word, look out, it's going to change you. I'm wondering how many people really actually have taken that and said, not, I'm going to be changed, but it is. It's, it is like radioactive material. You cannot see the change happening, but it is happening. It's occurring inside. And every day, more and more of the person of Christ is coming through, and less and less of my sin-filled, sin-stained person that would like to be the flesh working itself out and displaying itself, but this is the thing right here. So when I look at this, I see a prototype. I see the ability, if the mind will latch on to this, of recognition, the first place when people talk about giving and understanding about giving, recognition of God's presence and of God's person. Well, why else should I tithe? Well, I can give you many other reasons. You have enough time? You have more time? I can give you plenty more reasons. You know, people are, I think sometimes when you get on the subject, and I don't, now I'm off on giving, so God forgive me, but when you get on the subject, people seem, seem to take some, as I said, they put some strange glasses on. What does Psalm 24, 1 say? The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's. Oh, that's right. He did create it all, didn't he? But he didn't make me. <laughs> <laughs> that must be the attitude then, because then you walk around saying, well, I'm not giving, and I don't want to give anything. The earth is the Lord's, creator of heaven and earth. This is why I love that. Woven in right in there, it says, as he blessed him, brought forth bread and wine as he blessed him. Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. It's all his. And even you who think you don't, you don't belong, maybe you think you don't belong or you can't be owned or nobody wants you. Believe me, that's the beauty. I tell myself this every day. No one else would want me but the Lord. No one else could love me like the Lord. I've had more people forsake me be false friends, be, you know, they want to come in the good times, they want to be around when everything appears great, but I've had one friend in my life who's never left my side, who's never forsaken me, who's never let me down, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 
why should, why should this matter? Because I just spent a whole, we've done this, this whole hashing of Melchizedek here. Because this subject will be brought out more fully on the pages of Hebrews 7. This subject of understanding about tithes before the law and everything that happened before the law will become clearer as you get into Hebrews 7. And it happens very quickly. In one chapter, we'll deal with the priesthood, we'll deal with concepts of before the law, before the law, and then a change in the law. Can you imagine to a congregation who, oh, we, we don't want to hear about this because it could never, because the, God said it's an eternal forever, according to Aaron, according to the book of Exodus, according to Numbers, according to Deuteronomy, it's forever. And God said, oh, I changed my mind. God can do that. But he had a plan, by the way, from the beginning. So as I take this message and try and bring it to close, what I want you to know about this person, Melchizedek, is understanding him right in clarity and not with all this other stuff strung onto the sides, although it's, it's kind of fun to dig and to find out and to ask questions. Keep focused on the priesthood and the person, and when we uncover the fullest purpose of his use, it makes it abundantly clear, like many of those people who want to come into the church and they say, boy, I really like your teaching ministry, but I sure wish it was a lot more spiritual. You know, if you had some, some symbols and some, you know, things like that. And this is exactly what the, the book of Hebrews is, is railing against. If we understand what the life of faith is, Christ is formed in your heart by faith. Christ lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory, not signs and Stained glass windows, those are great. We have a stained glass window here in this building. That's wonderful. But that's not what it's about. That's all going to rot one day. And the most important thing is when you stand before him, understanding what you have faith in while you were here. Now, that's my responsibility, to open up the word and make it more clear so that you can crystallize and say, well, this is the beginning of understanding. Right here today, this is the beginning of understanding. Recognition of God's purpose made Abram pay tithes to Melchizedek. Now, we're not done on the subject. I hope we can come back and discuss this again and probe it even further through the book of Hebrews because we've got so many more things to talk about. But right now, for today, that is my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.